And now, the survival show that once survived, sipping lizard flavored water. Mmm. In this episode, we sit down with author Franklin Horton to discuss his book series, The Borrowed World. It's a story about an everyday, non super ninja guy who finds himself away from home when disaster strikes. Howdy and welcome to In the Rabbit Holes Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 211. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Franklin, welcome to In the Rabbit Hole. Thanks, Aaron. I'm glad to be here. I'm a fan of this show, and I'm excited to uh, be here with you. Well, very cool, and I'm excited to talk to you. Your Several of your books are actually sitting in my Audible wish list, so when I saw your name pop up, I was like, oh, yeah, I've been meaning to read his stuff. So this is fun. This is fun. Uh, be- before we get into that, though, let's get to know you a little bit better, Franklin. How did you come to writing? Because, of course, this is a book club episode, so lay it on us. Well... I, I think it's kind of like um, like a calling, like the ministry or something that, you know, people who, who enjoy writing, they can tell this about themselves early on in life. And I don't know if it's because of some character defect that you're not cut out to do anything else, but, you know, <laughs> you can usually spot it early on. So when I was young, I was probably 15 when I really started writing and and doing stories and, and kind of, I got a typewriter and I would sit and peck them out, you know? And, uh, so I went on to become an English major in college with the intention of writing. <clears throat> but then, you know, I had this illusion that when you got out of college and you wrote your first book that like this <laughs> chorus of angels would sing and a publisher mm-hmm. would come take your book and it would be miraculous, but it doesn't really happen that way. And it's, it's really difficult uh, or at least it was difficult to break in under that old uh, publisher agent system. So I could never really find an agent and therefore couldn't find a publisher. So I was never able to break through. I always knew I wanted to do this, but I wrote uh, seven completed novels that never saw the light of day before I finally broke through with a, a good prepper book that kind of uh, set me on my current path. Well, very cool. What uh, what genre were the other books in, just out of curiosity? The first two were, I guess, what they would have called uh, contemporary fiction at the time. Is, is I guess, a fancy way of saying they really don't have any plot and there's nothing to them except, you know, a situation that people are dealing with. As I went on, I became more interested in thrillers. And so that kind of helped me evolve to where I am now. I became more interested in the stuff I like to read, which had a lot of action and movement. And uh, that's that's kind of where I am now. So is writing your full-time gig now, is that what you do, or do you have a day job? <laughs> I wish it was my full-time gig. I do <laughs> have a day job uh, for about, uh, well, actually for most of my working career. I've, I've, I've had some breaks here and there where I've gone and done other things, but for most of my working career, I've worked in the mental health system, uh, not as a therapist or a treatment provider, but uh, for the past 20 years, I've been a facility manager for a mental health agency that has a bunch of different locations. So, you know, I buy buildings, build buildings, maintain buildings, uh, and just provide a place for people to do these services. I don't really go out and, you know, treat anybody, but it is kind of an interesting uh, field to be in because you you realize just how unstable people are in general. Yeah, I was going to ask, since you have an up close and personal view with that subject matter and with the occasional instability of the human mind, does that end up playing a, a role in your writing? Do you factor that in? Oh, absolutely. It's huge. And in, in, uh, in two ways, I use it primarily. And one is the fact that so many people are on mental health medication, because if you look at uh, the mental health system around 1900, uh, like my local state hospital had 7,000 people living there wow. around 1900. Now they only have 200, and that's because of all these new medications. So there are a lot of people out there in the world who are very severely psychotic, delusional uh bipolar, whatever, 
who, when their medicines run out, they're going to start hallucinating, they're going to become unstable, and they're going to become very difficult for their families to manage. And if they're out there on their own, they're going to start making really bad decisions and doing some crazy stuff. But the other thing uh, is I also work with, uh, we do substance abuse treatment. And a lot of substance abusers kind of live in a post-apocalyptic world right now because a lot of them are willing to do absolutely anything to get their drugs. And, and it just shows to you, if, if people are so willing to do crazy things for drugs, what will they do when it's a matter of food and uh, survival and all that? Because, you know, I've run across people who, who join prayer groups on Facebook so they can find out who has cancer and then go steal their medications. Oh, my God. Or they uh, stake out pharmacies to see who, who's leaving with big bags of pills. And, you know, if people do that just for drugs, when it's a matter of uh, feeding their families, they're going to get really dangerous really quick. Yeah. Wow. That's that's some in, – wow. In, in just like a few minutes, it was really good uh, – some really good t- takeaways there. Some really frightening takeaways too. Wow. Okay. So let's let's go into the books. Let's start with the you know you've got a bunch, but let's start with the first one. Tell us what it is. The borrowed world was based on uh, an experience that I was undergoing at the time, which I in my job I was having to travel from my home to Richmond, Virginia, twice a month. And that's about a 700-mile round trip. So it's not an enormous drive, but it's kind of aggravating. And, you know, it's it's a long, inconvenient drive. I was traveling with a group of people. Sometimes when you're taking a business trip, you don't get to pick the people to go with you. So you may have people that are, uh, you know, not necessarily people you get along with or people that you choose to take with you. So uh, this, this book is about this guy who is on this trip. And while he's away from home, there's a coordinated terror attack against the infrastructure of the country. And because they hit fuel refineries and they hit power transformers and they hit the cellular system, uh, we end up losing a lot of infrastructure in a short amount of time. Uh, The president enacts an executive order that freezes the fuel supply for first responders because so much of the refining capacity is lost. So this guy... And one of his friends who is on the trip with him are preparedness-minded people. They have bug-out bags, and contrary to their employer's policy, they carry firearms with them when they're traveling. And uh, they are more aware of what's going on than a lot of the people who are also on this trip with them. So there's a lot of disagreement about how to best manage this situation. And basically, they end up having to hoof it home. And it's about their experience of going home, what happens to them as they're making this trek, you know, 300 and some miles across the state. But aside from that, it also follows what this main character's family is going through at home. Because uh, as a prepper, he tried to teach his family about, you know, this is what you do if this happens. This is what you do if this happens. But, you know, he was never sure if they were really paying attention or if they were just kind of humoring him. So he used his experience as a facility manager at work to think, well, okay, I'm going to make an operational manual for my home. So he creates this little binder for his family. It's like, okay, if the power goes out, this is what you do. If you can't get fuel, this is what you do. This is where the uh, survival food is. This is how you hook the generator up. This is where the uh, spare ammunition is. This is where the spare magazines are. And so it's about his family going through this experience uh, without him of trying to operate their home and uh, maintain a safe environment while he's gone. Oh, wow. That definitely puts an interesting twist on things and probably drives it home for a lot of readers. Well, it does. And uh, the thing that I hear from a lot of folks is this is about an ordinary guy. This is not a military guy. This is not somebody who is prepared for every situation. He's kind of a guy that a lot of people think is maybe abrasive or kind of opinionated. And uh, he's not necessarily a warm and fuzzy character. He's a, he's a guy who uh, who reads a lot on the Internet and he's uh, preparedness and survival minded. But uh, he's not necessarily, you know, prepared for every situation. He may not make the right call every time. He's just somebody who's an ordinary guy, and he's trying to get home to his family, and he's hoping 
that he does the right thing in every situation, but he's just not always sure. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. <laughs> you, I think you just described my first boss when I was still in architecture and I was in uh, facilities management and construction management. That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a, a trait that matches I, a lot of people who end up in this profession. I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Still one of my favorite people in the whole world. But yeah, that's hysterical. That's <laughs> neat. How? So it sounds like you wove a lot of your own life experiences, which makes sense, into the book. And it sounds like you wove some, I mean, even with making that binder, some some rather practical things into the book itself. Yeah, it was an exploration at the time of a lot of the things I was kind of going through and taking my preparedness to the next level. Because there's a lot of us who, who know enough to where we think maybe we could get by. But how do you get your family? through a situation, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's dependent on them being with the program and them also understanding the basics of providing security to your home and, and keeping secrecy about uh, the resources you have and about, you know, not opening the door to strangers and all those things. So as I was writing this, I was kind of processing, well, this is what I need to teach my family and my young kids. And this is what I... I need to do to take it to the next level. And it, it as I went through the later books, because there's four in this series right now, it kind of evolves with that whole thing of getting yourself home is one thing. But once you get home, how do you stay safe and how do you keep your family safe and how do you continue to keep a small community safe uh, throughout a prolonged collapse event? Mm-hmm. When you write these books, are you just writing them because it's the passion, the the genre that you're passionate about, and you put some preparedness lessons and and kind of tips get woven into the story, or is it really you're trying to teach readers lessons, and the best tool you have to do that is to wrap it into a story? Well, I think the reason that my earlier books probably weren't ever published, you know, there were a variety of reasons. And now for a quick break. Listeners, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH? We'd love to give you more. Visit ITRH.net to find out about membership benefits. For starters, members get access to every episode ever produced and a monthly virtual conference. That's just for starters. And it's important to know in the rabbit hole is supported nearly entirely by roving horde armada members just like you that's how we pay the bills stay on the air keep the lights on around here so go to iturh.net to learn how you can become part of the iturh roving horde armada next up subscribe to the show through your favorite podcast app to make sure you never miss an episode by going to in the rabbit hole.com slash iTunes or in the rabbit hole.com slash Stitcher or in the rabbit hole.com slash iHeartRadio or in the rabbit hole.com slash Google Play. Or if you are one of those weirdos who listen to the show through YouTube, you can go to in the rabbit hole.com slash YouTube because you know what? We support weirdos. However weird you want to be, we're all about that. Now, back to the show woven into the story or is it really you're trying to teach readers lessons and the best tool you have to do that is to wrap it into a story? Well, I think the reason that my earlier books probably weren't ever published, you know, there were a variety of reasons, but those books were not books I was passionate about. And this topic is kind of the way I live. Myself and and some of the coworkers that I used in the books, you know, we are people that shoot together. We we uh, share information a lot, and these are things that I believe in. So uh, through the books, I'm trying to relay information to people. But I'm, you know, people get a little burned out when you beat them over the head. <laughs> if they're reading yeah. fiction, they're not wanting to read a technical manual. They're wanting an engaging story that may also drop a few pieces of useful information on them at the same time. And and people absorb that better. But the other thing that I think that this type of fiction really does is, you know, you may understand how to prepare food and you may understand how to, to store 
you know, all kinds of things. But the thing that's hard to explore is scenarios of, of what would you do in this situation or why would responding this way be better than responding another way? And that's what the fiction helps you do is it throws these situations at you and you get to see how they either thrive or they get thrashed by the choice they make. And I, and I think that helps people a lot because, uh, you know, it may stick with you uh, for a long time. I'm not going to do this because this guy did that and I saw exactly what happened. I saw how it played out in this book. And a lot of those are, are realistic scenarios. Mm-hmm. How did you yourself get into preparedness? I live in hillbilly country, basically. You know, this is uh, the central Appalachian Mountains of Virginia. This is an area where you still have a lot of people who who raise their own food and live on family farms that people have been on for generations. Uh, it's still real common to meet people who, who raise a good portion of their food and live out of their gardens. You know, my grandparents were that way, and, and I grew up um, around people who believed in, in being armed and able to take care of your own stuff, everything from raising your food to fixing the things that you have. So, you know, with my family, we try to live that way, too. We certainly aren't as independent as people were a generation or two ago, but we try to raise stuff and, and we try to be prepared for certain types of situations. The, the biggest thing that we deal with here now on a consistent basis is weather events. You know, we had a, a snow storm back in, I guess it was 96 or 97, where we had 40 some inches of snow dumped on us in a weekend. And we were just paralyzed by that. People couldn't go out for a week. People lost power, some people for six weeks. Uh, you didn't have phone. So, you know, people who were unprepared during that time, it was like a hurricane, you know, except with cold weather. And there were people who were stuck in bed eating cold soup because they didn't have any heat and they didn't have an alternative way to heat up their food. So, you know, even if you're just preparing for a weather event, you have to have some basic level of preparedness or you can just be totally blindsided. So I've tried to teach my kids that. and That's the way we try to live on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I've gotten into a few books and I've been kind of twitchy after I put him down, and, and I'm kind of looking for another one of those books right now to, to you get a little addicted to that. And, and always afterwards, they end up impacting the way I prepare in some way. And I would imagine writing these books, you've got to have your head so deep in them that something similar happens during the process. What's that like, and how has writing these books ended up changing the way you, you prep? Probably the biggest example is a lot of us are individualists and that's that's why we think the way we do and that's why we live the way we do and and that's kind of the way I went into this is I'm a one man show my family is here with me and we plan to you know take care of ourselves and it's just going to be us but as part of researching these books and and really spending hours and hours and hours uh, thinking these scenarios out. Because one thing you want to do is when you present a situation in a book, you want it to be realistic. You want people to read that situation and, and think, well, that could really happen rather than people read it and go, well, that's just ridiculous. Things would never happen that way. So one of the things I realized over the course of this book is that uh, you just can't do it alone. There's no way you can provide security for a small area, even if you're just talking about a couple of homes. You know, you've got to sleep sometimes. Somebody's got to be sleeping. Somebody's got to be providing security. Somebody's got to be preparing food. So I pretty quickly realized, that you know, I wasn't going to make it. In a prolonged situation, there was going to have to be uh, a community and friends and people who could help you out. Otherwise, you're just doomed. Would you say that's the biggest takeaway that people get from your books is that understanding of community? I think so, other than that in the first book, the thing that people really uh, initially seem to get is, you know, the character in this book is, is a lot like myself. Uh, I have camped and backpacked a lot, so I kind of brought this aspect into the book of, you know, this guy, besides being a prepper, was also a backpacker. So he explored gear, not just from the tactical side, but also from the uh, the weight, how durable are your packs, how much weight can you carry. And a lot of people uh, have mentioned to me that that discussion, 
move? You know, how much can you easily manage? And do you really need this? Do you really need an axe in your pack? You know, all those things mm-hmm. have been eye-opening to them. And so I think that that first thing of, of having a get-home bag, which is what the guy in the first book does, he has a get-home bag with him. Uh, you know, I hear from truck drivers all the time who say that the big takeaway they got is they never go to a strange city and park their truck with an empty fuel tank. Because that's one of the mistakes that this character made. Mm. And, you know, because if something happens overnight, like when you declare war or something like that, the fuel price shoots up, then, you know, you're oh, yeah. you're pretty much screwed. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's, that's a pretty good one. Wow. Huh. You know, and that's interesting as far as taking a look at gear from a perspective of the, the camping and backpacking and hiking. And I think that that speaks to the, uh, which has been a, a running joke, at least in some of the older episodes, about uh, the silliness that it seems to always ensue around bug out bags when people first get started and they build these giant, ridiculous bug out bags and uh, and they lack the physical conditioning to uh, to actually hump a rucksack that big, uh, or just they're carrying just too much crap that they just don't need. So that's that's pretty interesting. That's definitely a, a, a good perspective on that. Well, backpackers ex- have a lot of experience with that. And I mm. know that when I first started backpacking, I had a much exaggerated impression of my ability to carry weight. <laughs> and, you know, you may be able to carry a pack of a certain weight, but can you carry it for 15 miles? And even mm-hmm. if you can carry it for 15 miles, can you carry it for 15 miles for five days in a row? Yeah. And even though I was able to force myself, on my first extended backpacking trip to carry this weight, what ended up happening was I ended up getting a knee injury that took a long time to heal because you can force yourself to do it, but you have limits. And so one of the things I discovered was even dropping just like five pounds off that pack made a significant difference in how much pain I experienced. You know, if you're on a long trip, you're going to experience some pain, but the less it hurts, the more fun you're going to have. Yeah, definitely. To circle back to your writing for a moment, where where do you draw inspiration from as far as writing styles and things like that? Like which authors, whether in the genre or not, just authors in general, who do you cotton to? What do you, what do you look to and say, I want to, you know, have their, vo- not have their voice, but kind of model yourself after? Well, you know, it's funny because uh, it's it's a lot of really dark books. Like a lot of people my age who write, I grew up reading Stephen King. Books. So, you know, every once in a while that Stephen King stuff creeps into there and there'll be some really creepy, really horror type scene that people will write to me later and say, man, that was pure Stephen King, you know. Uh, so even though it may be prepper fiction or post-apocalyptic fiction, that Stephen King creeps in there. But also uh, Cormac McCarthy is one of my favorites. And he, he wrote the book that became the movie The Road, mm-hmm. which is an extremely dark book and dark movie. But before writing that, he wrote a lot of Westerns and he wrote No uh, Country for Old Men and a lot of these other just really, really dark books. And and a lot of that creeps into my books, too, because in these times, it's, you know, if you're writing about a really grim collapse scenario, it's not like the waltz. It's not like you're returning to the depression and everybody is poor but happy. You know, there are some dark times, and uh, I think people need to accept that there will be hard decisions and some dark times. And, uh, you know, you just accept that that's part of the reality of it. So there are some hard decisions. I mean, people struggle in these books with whether they're making the right call. You know, there are always people who say, well, you know, I'd just kill everybody who got in my way. But, you know, people struggle with killing, no matter how trained and no matter how fixed your mindset is. You know, the first time somebody does that in these books and in life both, they struggle with that, mm-hmm. and that's a lot of what these characters go through. That's uh, that's good stuff. I, I, yeah, I'm getting excited. I'm looking forward to reading your book now because that's cool. I hope you get sucked in. I, I'm, you know, it sounds like I might. I think that's something that a lot of prepper books that I end up the the fiction I end up reading is they they lack the uh, that that creepiness that Stephen King esque that kind of grab you by the 
by the short hairs and really take you for a ride onto the dark side because that is more realistic, I think, of what any of these collapses would look like than anything. But to to kind of move on, what is your prepper pet peeve? Like what thing in the community or what what kind of wise tale that gets told drives you crazy whenever you hear it? You know, it's hard to say, but it's it's probably that belief that you can just kill everybody who crosses your path and gets in your way. I just don't know that that's realistic. It, it's a lot of those tough talk mindset kind of things of people saying, well, you know, everybody who comes to my house is just going to be turned away or they're going to be shot before they get even close. It's easy to say that, but do you really have the mindset that you're going to sit in front of your family and shoot at people that you know because they're coming up to your house to ask for food? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it may not be that you're going to share food with them. It may be that you've got a story prepared that you don't have resources to share, but I think it's unrealistic to think that you're going to handle every situation with violence. Uh, there may be situations that you have to respond to with violence, but I think that you got to have a backup plan also. Probably on a much more practical level, the thing that gets to me sometimes is everybody thinking they have to pack an axe in their bug out bag. <laughs> you know, it adds a lot of weight, and I've backpacked a lot, and there's Usually enough deadfall, even on a heavily used trail like the Appalachian Trail, there's usually enough deadfall and stuff you can snap off and drag to a fire that you don't really need to be hauling a heavy axe with you. Hmm, that's pretty good, huh? You know, and that brings up, what do you feel is your most important piece of gear? Probably um, a knife, because uh, I know a lot of people that rely on their guns, but uh, a knife and a good flashlight and And early on, I I wasn't a big believer in the flashlight, but once I adopted a flashlight into my everyday carry, it's uh, amazing how many times a day you need a flashlight or Mm -hmm. that it just makes life more convenient to use. But but probably a knife and having a, a good knife that has the blade that's suited for what you're doing, because, you know, a lot of people and and I fall victim to this, too. You know, you go shopping for a knife and you're like, I want a good practical knife I can carry in my pocket. And you come out with, you know, something that's way bigger than what you really need. (laughs) It's just human nature. But probably a knife. You can do so much with a knife and there's probably no more versatile tool that you'll use every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. I think a knife and a flashlight are two things that as soon as you put them in your pocket, you go through a day and you just wonder, God, how did I get through days before without a knife and a flashlight? Yeah, absolutely. And a decent flashlight because, you know, I've bought a bunch of these cheap things that I ended up throwing away. And, uh, you know, I've got one of these micro stream lights now. And I'm like, man, this is a good flashlight. It just, it works every time I use it. So what would you say is your go-to rifle? Are you a, uh, or I should say go-to long gun? Uh, are you a shotgun guy, an AK guy, an AR-15 guy, or good old just bolt action? What's your go-to zombie apocalypse uh, rifle? My go-to rifle is an AR because I just uh, I love the AR platform. I enjoy shooting them. I enjoy building them. Uh, it's just if I go to the gun safe and I'm grabbing something, that's what I will grab. My home defense gun that, that I use is an 8.7 shotgun. But that's for if I was shooting in the house in the mm-hmm. dark. But generally, it's an AR. I, I love the ARs. What would you say is the best $100 you've ever spent on prep? Probably uh, water filtration. Mm. You know, it's it's one of those little things that, you know, there's so much cooler stuff than water filters mm-hmm. that uh, it's it's one of those things people overlook a lot. But... When I got into backpack and I bought like a, I guess it was an $89 pump water filter, there's lighter stuff out there now and there's more flashy stuff, but that water filter is rock solid. And I've drank out of nasty mud puddles with it. I've drank out of brown, muddy rivers with it. And, uh, you know, the water may not always taste the best. It may taste like lizards or leaves or whatever, but, you know, it makes water that you can drink and not get sick. That's really a good, a really good point and very important. Well, awesome, dude. Well, Franklin, 
tell us the name of your book and the series one more time. Book series is called Borrowed World. Uh, the first book is The Borrowed World, and then there's a, a, a second book, Ashes of the Unspeakable. Legion of Despair came after that, and then the newest one, No Time for Mourning, uh, just came out uh, on Valentine's Day. Because nothing says I look like a good, gory, <laughs> apocalyptic book. Uh, so it was a Valentine's Day release. And then there's a spinoff that's still associated with the series called Locker Nine, which is about a dad trying to get his daughter home from college. But there's five books out there total. And people can go to my website, franklinhorton.com, and uh, find more about them or get them on Amazon. Uh, they're also on audiobook. Uh, the audiobook is read by uh, Kevin Pierce, who did Glenn Tate's 299 Days series. Oh, okay. Uh, people love the audiobooks. They have a fanatic following, and uh, Kevin is just master at reading this kind of book. So tell us your website address one more time. That is uh, franklinhorton.com. Awesome. Well, Franklin, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with us a little bit about you and uh, a little bit about your books, man. I, it, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I enjoyed it. I appreciate you having me. Thank you very much. Show notes, resources, and links to today's guests can be found at intherabbithole.com slash E211. Remember to support the show and get members-only benefits by going to itrh.net. In the Rabbit Hole is supported nearly entirely by ITRH Roving Horde Armada members just like you. Again, that's itrh.net. With that, we wrap up episode number 211 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. <laughs>